of Yahweh, who stand in the house of Yahweh, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise Yahweh, for Yahweh is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For Yahweh has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that Yahweh is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever Yahweh pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. It is he who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and of beast, who in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to his people Israel. Your name, O Yahweh, endures forever. Your renown, O Yahweh, throughout all ages. For Yahweh will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. O house of Israel, bless Yahweh. O house of Aaron, bless Yahweh. House of Levi, bless Yahweh. You who fear Yahweh, bless Yahweh. Blessed be Yahweh from Zion. He who dwells in Jerusalem, praise Yahweh. And here's the call and response that we did this morning. You don't have to do the response, but I'm going to read it for you and see how this is a response to Psalm 135. Give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him alone, who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, for his steadfast love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, for his steadfast love endures forever. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever. But overthrew Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings, for his steadfast love endures forever and killed mighty kings. For his steadfast love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, for his steadfast love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, for his steadfast love endures forever. And gave their land as a heritage, for his steadfast love endures forever. A heritage to Israel, his servant, for his steadfast love endures forever. It, is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever, and rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. He who gives food to all flesh, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. (laughs) 
Holy God, you are the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the God of heaven. We praise you for your steadfast love endures forever. We said it so many times, but not enough. You alone do great wonders. You made the sea, the earth, the heavens, the moon, the sun, the stars. You struck down the firstborn in Egypt. Pharaoh, the horse and his rider, you threw into the sea. Great and mighty kings of the Amorites. And you sustained Israel through the wilderness and gave them an inheritance. And you sustained your people then. And you sustain us now. You alone are worthy of our praise. This morning, as we look at this psalm of thanksgiving, may we be humbled in your sight. May we see how your hand has continued to provide for your people. From the old covenant to the new covenant, providing your son, Jesus Christ, for a savior for us. May our eyes no longer be fixed on ourselves or this world or the sin that entangles us, but may our eyes be fixed on you, our God, the one who must be worshipped. Help us to repent of sin. May Jesus in his cross be believed on. May hearts be encouraged. And may love for you, God, and Jesus, your son, be elevated in the preaching of your word. We praise you for your steadfast love endures forever. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Are you a forgetful person? Here stands before you a very forgetful person. You have probably fallen victim to my embarrassing second greeting. Not this morning. I made a, a conscious effort not to do it, but this is what happens. You come through the door on a Sunday morning. I greet you. I say, hi, my name's Scott. You tell me your name. We talk a bit. And wouldn't you know it, the next Sunday morning, you walk through the door. I say, hi, we chat, and we get talking, and I say, ah, what was your name again? And maybe you've done this yourself. It happens with a coworker, a neighbor, but there you are, forgetful you. And we, we need reminders. We are very forgetful. Uh, I don't know about you, I'm taking notes a lot. Sometimes if you told me your name, you might have seen me scratch it down on a sheet of paper because it's going right through my mind. Uh, we need reminders. We use our phones for these a lot. Sheets of paper, whatever we can. But reminders are needed. They help us a lot. But is reminders something that God needs? Perhaps you're here this morning thinking, yes. I think God does need reminders because I think he's forgotten me. I think he's forgotten a lot of us. And you might be a realist here this morning. You've read all these nice words about God's love, but you're, you're thinking, Scott, there's disease, there's destruction, there's death. God's love, okay, that sounds nice, but I'm not seeing that. We don't usually get the why there's disease, destruction, or death. We don't often get the why. God allows these things to happen. But he reminds us that he still loves us. And the question might not be to figure out the why, but as you see God's love, are you giving him the trust that he is worthy of? In our text today, God reminds us that it's him who feeds us, frees us, has not forgotten us. We don't have to remind him to do these things. He has to remind us. It's us who are forgetful. So this morning, I want to take you through the text. We're going to be in Psalm 136. And we're going to look at these reminders. God's trying to remind you of his love. And if you didn't already hear it, he reminded you 26 times, if you're counting. And these reminders are to send us to thank God. And if you're anything like me, I need a reminder to thank God. And you might be thinking, Scott, okay, but I'm not seeing a lot of things to thank God for. Again, the psalmist is going to walk you through some reminders. 
And yes, we're not going to go through all uh, somewhere between 22 and 26 reminders. We'll narrow it down to three. And hopefully those would be a bit more all-encompassing. So the three reasons that you can be thanking God. First, be thankful to God for feeding us. Second, be thankful to God for freeing us. And third, be thankful to God for not forgetting us. Before we jump right into these three reasons, it's really important you look at this whole psalm. It, again, I said it's a response to Psalm 135. Maybe you picked that up. I was reading. You're thinking, oh, this is really similar. I'm seeing a lot of the same words, so a lot of the same things going on. Yeah, our text is a response to God's faithfulness to his people. And it's called, an, Psalm 136 is an antiphonal song. Anybody know what that means? See, we set the room up today in two sections, and we did this. Andrew led us through this. One side did one part of the psalm and the other part. So we're in two groups. This is something that has been done since the Old Testament times with this psalm. You were participating in a, piece, a little piece of history today. The Levitical priest would read the first section, and the Israelite congregation responded with, For his steadfast love endures forever. This was a thanksgiving psalm. And the people kept saying that refrain. Well, what, what is this refrain line all about? The people thanking God and saying, for his steadfast love endures forever. Were you getting a little tired of that? Anybody getting a little tired of that? It's okay. It's all right. Maybe it felt like brainwashing a bit. What's going on here? Especially if this is your first Sunday. Is this, is this normal here? Well, this is actually nothing new. We repeat courses here in the, in the church service, but you do this when you're riding in your car, when you've got the radio on. This week, uh, we heard on the radio, Queen's Another One Bites the Dust. Do you know how many times they say that in the song? Somewhere between 18 and 30. So we went easy on you with 26 today. So uh, these lines, we like to repeat lines in songs, but why repeat this one? Why are the Israelites repeating this phrase? Was it important? Yes. But depending on your translation here, I'm not sure if someone has uh, perhaps the NIV or NASB or King James, you'll see here that steadfast love could be translated loving kindness, mercy, love. We're trying to get at the meaning of a Hebrew word that's, that is hesed, and it's connected with God and his faithfulness to Israel. This phrase, for his steadfast love endures forever, this phrase came at a very important time in the history of Israel. And you just said it. But what is the history? You don't maybe have a lot of history with that phrase. Do you, does anyone know the narrative? You can shout out the chapter or the situation if you know it. It's okay. I had to look it up this week too. The phrase is when the priest's the priest said this phrase right before the glory of the Lord came into the temple at Solomon's dedication. Let me read this to you. This is from 2 Chronicles 5, verses 13 and 14. When the Levites sing this song, the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments and praise to Yahweh, the Lord, for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. The house, the house of Yahweh was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not even stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of God. And Solomon does this prayer of dedication and look what happens next. As soon as Solomon finished the prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, the sacrifices, and the glory of Yahweh then filled the temple. And the priest could not even enter the house of Yahweh because the glory of Yahweh filled Yahweh's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of Yahweh on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to Yahweh, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God is is the God of gods, the God we serve. Not that the other gods are anything. 
in their time, it would have been Baal or uh, the Astra, all these different false gods they were serving. And the psalmist plays into that. He says, whatever you think are gods, this is the true God. Whatever, whatever king or ruler is over you, this is the true Lord, the true king. There's none higher, stronger, or wiser. And what is our response? He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. If you're following the King James Version, again, that refrain would use the word mercy, for his mercy endures forever. In his commentary on this psalm, the English Baptist pastor Charles Haddon Spurgeon said that this refrain is the sweetest stanza a man can sing. And Spurgeon, again, he said, we repeat it in every verse, but none too often. This stanza is a reminder to the Israelites of God's presence with them. Just like it was in the temple, they're reminded that God is with them. And if you are believing in Jesus Christ, he is with you now, Christian. Far better than a, a glory that you couldn't enter. The Spirit of the Lord is with you. That is our Emmanuel. So in verse 1 to 3, we're thanking God. He is good. He's the God of gods, the Lord of lords. And in verse 4, if you look in your text with me, it says, to him who alone does great wonders. So what are these wonders? There are many. You could probably think of some. But where do you start? So the psalmist says, wet our appetite. Okay, tell me, what are these wonders? Let's get specific. So let's jump into these wonders of God. And as I go through the text this morning, continue through the text, I'm actually going to use verses 23, 24, and 25 to help us summarize this psalm. The psalmist does this at the end. You might have thought, how does those three verses fit in? They actually are taking you backwards through verses 5 to 9, 10 to 16, and 17 to 22. So I'll walk you through this, and you'll see how this is going to be helpful understanding our text and what God's trying to teach us through this psalm. So our first point is taken from verse 25. It says, He who gives food to all flesh. Again, this is going to direct our focus for verses 5 to 9. So, what would the psalmist have you thank God for? Thank God for feeding you. Thank God for feeding you. Did you eat your breakfast this morning? No, you skipped it? <laughs> Maybe you had just a little coffee? In our, in our house most days, there's a lot of buttered toast and jam and cups of tea going around, and the kids are slowly getting used to the toaster, and we have the, we have the fire detector right above it, just in case. Um, but what you, what you see here, you've got wheat in the bread, and you've got raspberries for the jam. But where does all this growth come from? I'm not growing these. I'm picking them up to the store. They're from a farmer. But all these materials, this is something that God has made. He's made the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars, and they work in synchronicity so that up from the soil, we have these things grow. And you see in your text, if you got your hand there, that he made the heavens an understanding, verse 5. It's God's wisdom that he fashioned the world, separating the waters from the earth. He alone knew how the sun and the moon were supposed to orbit to make life here possible. It's verse 6. Uh, verse 7 and 8. And he alone made the stars and does great wonders. But as you ate your breakfast this morning, sipped your coffee, were you actually thinking, this meal is the difference of life or death? I wasn't. <laughs> Just going about talking, not thinking about it. We're so often separated that a meal and starvation are, are hand in hand. If you don't eat, you're going to die. You're going to waste away. We usually eat on craving. That looks good. I'll eat that in our North American context. So how often are you actually thinking that? If I go without food and water, this could actually be the end for me. When we eat, you're actually declaring that you are finite. You are dependent. God doesn't have to eat. He's a spirit, infinite and eternal. We are not. I have to eat. 
sometimes more than you guys. <laughs> but no one feeds God. Yet God, he feeds us. And his steadfast love endures forever. He shows his continual care and love for you even when you eat. The world eats. But much of the world is not thanking God for it. But they're continuing every time they put their hand to their mouth saying, I, I need God's help. I need his love. They don't know that. They don't know God is sustaining them in something so simple as just your breakfast. And since creation, he's maintained our world. You can look at Mars. You can look at Venus. You can look at the other planets. They can't do that. They can't sustain life. But he's put you here on this world. And you can talk to uh, Josh Grant. He's been reading a bit on apologetics, just how the spheres are orbiting and life is sustainable here. So one of the arguments for God is just how our universe operates. And you're eating every time and saying, yep, I'm finite. I need God. And you should thank him. This is a reason to thank him. Often, every meal you eat. I'm going to dig in a bit to what this is actually talking about in a theological sense. God is giving you food in his providence. Maybe you've heard us use this word before, providence. Well, what do you mean by providence, Scott? It's a big word. God providing for all of his creation is probably one of the best ways to put it. But it's more than that. It's connected with another word, sovereignty. Another big word. The sovereign one provides for all. These two words, sovereignty and providence, they're connected, but they are distinct. Sovereignty tells you of God's character. He reigns over all. That's who he is, sovereign. Providence shows you God's actions. You can't see God's sovereignty, but you can see his providence. Provides for all, it's what he does. So when we say God is king, that's his sovereignty. When he, he is your provider, that's his providence. Pastor John Piper, he says that, that God's sovereignty is his right and power to do the all that he pleases. God's providence is the exercise of that right. So sovereignty and providence. Sovereignty, the right to do all things. Providence, the exercise of that right. You know God is sovereign when you see his providence. You know he reigns when you see his provision. You can thank God that he's good when you get to eat. The films Jaws, E.T., Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan. Anybody seen some of these? Yep, almost everybody. There's something they have in common. Does anybody know? You know. Yes. Bang on. Steven Spielberg. He directed all of these movies. Critics do not say Spielberg is a good director. They don't. They say Spielberg is American cinema. Us mere mortals do not approach Steven Spielberg to give him advice. We rather watch and learn. Not even an OCAD graduate from uh, downtown is going to go up and teach Steven Spielberg about film directing. You're not going to do that. When we talk about the God of the universe, we're not just talking about a renowned film, a renowned film director. Spielberg, he can direct wonders on film, but God directs the sun, the moon, the stars, life and sustaining in here, feeding you. He doesn't need a hand at the camera, direction for the next scene, not even from Spielberg. God alone does wonders. If you're familiar with Job, he thought he could question God's directing. He did. And you know what God told him? This is Job 38. He said, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined it me its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? 
God created and sustains the universe. He directs all these things. He alone works wonders. So what should you do? You do like Job did. Do you know what Job did after jo God gave him a talking to? Repents in dust and ashes. He was humbled completely. Even though he had been through so much. Humbled. And he responded in praise. Humbled, repent, and praised God. We praise him who directs the universe and through it he feeds you, sustains you. This God of loving kindness and his steadfast love endures forever. So thank the God who feeds you. Our second admonition from the psalm is to thank God for freeing you. This comes from verse 24. So we've done 25, we're in 24 now. And in your text, if you're reading the English Standard Version, it says, He rescued us from our foes, for his steadfast love endures forever. And I like how the NIV gets this with the alliteration. They translate it, For God freed us from our foes. So this, this section in the middle here is the redemption section. It can be divided into two parts, verses 10 to 15 and 17 to 22, with verse 16 in the middle. So you're jumping around. You've got your finger in your Bible here, trying to follow. 10 to 15, this is the flight from Egypt. And 17 to 22, being delivered from the other kings. And how you can see this divided in your text, if you have your finger in verse 10, it says, to him who struck down... Put your finger on 17, to him who struck down. This is the dividing point here to show you of two massive things the Lord has done. So the psalmist walks through in verses 10 to 15 what God did in the Exodus. Now, for your teachers here, you can check the verbs. Let me read you this. He struck down the firstborn in Egypt, brought Israel out, divided the Red Sea in two, made Israel pass through the midst of it, overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea, struck down, brought out, divided in two, made Israel pass through, overthrew, verbs and participles. But you see this, our God acts. Do you see how the psalmist in 135 was making fun? He said, if you've got your finger there, he says, the idols of the nations, this is 135 verse 15, the idols of the nations, silver and gold, works of human hands. Mouths but do not speak, eyes do not see, ears do not hear. There's no breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them. But our God's not like that. Our God's alive. And he's showing you here, he's acting for his people. I want you to look at verse 12 there. It says, with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. If, if you know your Old Testament, this is not a new phrase either. You compare verse 12 here with Deuteronomy 4, verses 33 and 34. I'm going to read this for you. Did any people ever hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire as you have heard and still live? Or has any God ever attempted to go and take another nation for himself from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, and by war? By a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and by great deeds of terror, all of which Yahweh your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. You see, this phrase, with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, is a reoccurring anthropomorphism. So we attribute human body part to God. Ten dollar word there. But this is, this is how we talk, right? We use these kind of phrases. And this phrase for God occurs in Exodus 6, Deuteronomy 5, 11, 26. It reminds Israel of God's strength to free them from their foes. On Passover night, the spotless lamb, this is in Egypt. Passover night, the spotless lambs died for the firstborns of Israel, not for Egypt. And this God saved his people from death through the Passover lamb. God freed them from the plague of death and defeated their enemy, enemy ruler. Does that sound familiar? This is what God has done for us in the fullness of time. 
He's freed a people from the plague of death and our enemy ruler, Satan. Redeeming his people once again, freedom from bondage and sin in the sacrificial lamb of God. Do you remember what John the Baptist said? He said, behold, the lamb of God, when he saw Jesus. That's by no mistake. Jesus is the one final sacrifice. He was sacrificed on a Roman cross, bearing our burdens. Jesus rescues us from our foes, Satan, from sin, from God's wrath in hell. He paid our debt, was buried, and rose victorious, and his steadfast love endures forever. If you've not been rescued, seek the God who rescued Israel, who rescues the church, who still rescues sinners today. There's no other God. This is he. Repent of your rebellion. Your sin surrounds you. Or have you closed your eyes to it? When was the last time you thanked God? Your creator, your savior, your sustainer. This should be a warning to you, just the lack of thankfulness that you have. And you can think about just even in your own life, you look at those around you, there are many sins that plague us. Anger, impatience, lust on your phone, stealing at work, cheating on your spouse, hating neighbors, from bitterness, gossip, and murder. They plague us all. But these sins are weeds of a greater root. The root sin is our rebellion against God. You're just seeing weeds of it. You can cut down those weeds. They're just going to spring up elsewhere. It doesn't matter how much you try and fix here until you've actually fixed the main root problem is your rebellion with God. And you need to go to Jesus to fix them. No, health, no 12-week uh, step program is going to get you out of that. You go to the cross. Sure, there's other ways to help you deal with these problems, but we go to the cross and God will change you from the inside out. He will put his spirit in you to make you a holy person, a holy man, a holy woman for God, and then you will do good works out of that love that he's put in you. God exalted Jesus Christ, the right, his right hand, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and in this room today, Renaissance Baptist, if you're in here, one day your knee will bow to him. But will you do it willingly before the time comes to repent and believe in Jesus and thank the God of gods that he has freed you? The third admonition from the psalmist is to thank God for not forgetting you. Thank him for not forgetting you. And this comes from verse 23. If you look in our text here, it says, It is he who remembered us in our low estate, for his steadfast love endures forever. Ever wonder why they call it the book of Numbers? You've been reading through, or you can flip through in your, in your Bible there. It's the fourth book of your Bible. It's called Numbers. And I imagine Kelly Campos likes it because she likes math. But uh, I am not much of a math guy, so I instinctively want to skip over that book and then get on to something else. Um, it doesn't really get me excited to read. And I could skip a lot of headaches going over this book. If you're wondering why it's called that, maybe you know. Um, we follow in, if you're wondering how you got your Bible, we actually follow the Septuagint name, which comes from Numbers chapter 1, verse 2 where it says that they wrote down the families of Israelites numbers by their names. So that's, we follow, they take the word numbers there, and that's how they referred to it when they did the third century Greek translation of the Old Testament. For you scholars out there who like that. But I like how the Hebrews, how when they wrote their Old Testament, they, they actually went right with verse 1. And they didn't call it numbers, but they called it Bamidbar, which in Hebrew means in the wilderness. And this is taken from Numbers 1.1. 1, 1. Yahweh spoke to Moses, Bamidbar, in the wilderness, in Sinai. So as you read the book of Numbers, or in the wilderness, that's what it's about. 
If you've been wondering, what's the numbers about? It's about being in the wilderness, when the Israelites are in the wilderness. So if you've been looking at our text, did you look at verse 16? To him who led his people through the wilderness. So we want to know, how did God remember the Israelites when they were in the wilderness? And this is what verses 17 to 20 start to tell us. God struck down great kings, mighty kings. And the psalmist mentions two mighty Amorite kings God destroyed before they entered Canaan. Sihon, king of Heshbon, and if you know your ancient Near East where these uh, lakes are, just off of the Mediterranean. Heshbon is northeast of the Dead Sea, or for you guys, northeast of the Dead Sea. Um, and Og, king of Ashan, was northeast of the Sea of Galilee, so a little further north and northeast. So why does it matter where these are from? Scott, what's with the geography lesson? These places are reminders of God's remembering them. Reminders of his steadfast love. You see, these lands, Heshbon and uh, Bashan, Heshbon was a city and Bashan was a region. These places are given as an inheritance to the tribes. They're given to Reuben, Gad, half-tribe of Manasseh. Even when they're in the wilderness, before they cross the Jordan and go and get the rest of the land, you want to talk about low estate during this 40 years. How about no estate they had no land, no home. They're nomads, no place to live. So what does God do? God strikes down these kings and gives them an inheritance. And it reads as a heritage in verses 21 and 22. God shows his steadfast love to Israel in giving them an inheritance. So you're reading this and you're thinking, okay, Scott, how does this apply to me? Am I going to get an inheritance? Is God going to kill my enemies and give me some good land here? Hard to come by especially here in southern Ontario. Very hard to come by. Is this what God is going to do? Back up a little. God remembers you in your low estate, but he is not necessarily promising you real estate. You can ask. Go ahead and ask. But Israel was experiencing God's momentary gift of land. As you come to believe in Jesus, as you come into a relationship with him, you are actually in a better situation, a better covenant with God than Israel was. Israel was experiencing God's momentary gift of land. And, and that was a momentary promise. But for you, you have a better inheritance built on better promises. God has given his Holy Spirit to you. He preserves his people for all who believe in Jesus. His spirit is a guarantee to secure us until we reach him in heaven. Jesus with us, our Emmanuel. And he says that. If you remember at the end of Matthew 28, he says, I'm with you till the end of the age. If you're a Christian, that promise is for you. So thank him, praise him, be reminded that God is with you when you're looking for a job, when you're sick, when you're lonely. He will not forsake you. He is with you right now. We have so many reasons to thank him for his steadfast love endures forever. Last week in Roncesville, a suburb in West Toronto, there was a man crossing the street and hit, there was a hit and run. Hit, he died there in the middle of the street and the car sped off. And you can be praying for this family. I was trying to find their name um, but they're obviously grieving. Um, and uh, pray that the Lord would comfort them and help them through this. Um, but it's sad when we hear this. This is not the first. This probably will not be the last. Just a hit and run, heartless. We hear about death, destruction, disease. So preventable. And again, we wonder, where is God? Has he forgotten us? This is the question I asked you when we began to look at the psalm. Again, God's not going to, hand you out the why. But as we looked in the text, he's showing you that he loves you, cares for you. And that love lasts for a little time, longer time, endures forever. It doesn't stop. 
Our texts remind us that the God who brings life, he's not afraid to even bring death. He gave all these promises, but many people were killed. But this is not outside of God's hand. He is not a guilty party. But again, his plans are not always known to us. We don't know that why. But we cling to what he tells us here, that we are to see his love and to give him our trust. He has not forgotten you. His mercy endures world without end. Before we sing the final hymn and go and enjoy some barbecue, I hope you'll stay with us. Um, I just have a final reflection on this psalm. So as you go and eat, thank the God of creation who feeds you. As you talk with others, give thanks to the God of salvation who has saved you if you believe in Christ. And as you drive home, praise the God who has not forgotten you. He remembers you. Again, the world around you, the pessimist and the realist will say, again, Scott, Scott, disease, destruction, and death. Is, 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 how can you say God is here? And we talked about God's sovereignty and his providence. While someone like a realist is saying that, maybe you're here this morning as a realist and saying, I can't see God's grace but every time you go to eat, you're, 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 you're telling yourself that this is not true. God is providing for you. And he's provided salvation, but will you, will you seek him? In his sovereignty, he is king. Even if you can't see it, you're seeing his providence. And life and death are in God's hands. He won't give you the why, but he shows you his love. He's given the final death punch to sin, Satan, and the world's powers in Christ's cross. And if you've come to know the God Almighty, he promises to be with you, our God, Emmanuel. He's not forgotten you. He remembers you. He hears you. Call out to him. Praise him for his steadfast love endures forever. Again, he's fed you, freed you, not forgotten you, and praise him. Would you say it with me one last time? For he is good for his Steadfast love endures forever. Amen.